can you see me audible visible <laughs> hello friends ha huh, that's what i'm saying am i audible am i visible yes Yes, आपकी स्लाइड है yes. मैं आपको व्हाट्सएप कर देता हूँ बच्चों को मैं एक सेकेंड देना सर दस मिनट है ना नो प्रॉब्लम है ना ओके डन सर डन ओके okay we are still waiting for few friends who have not got the link they are just getting the link uh, and they are being directed to the section in the app so that they can join us and i can see some of you already joined welcome uh, we'll just wait for a few minutes and then uh, quickly start our session in the meantime and just uh, for your information uh, we are planning a short quick revision session for biochemistry i know uh, that uh, tomorrow we have some exam and uh, all of you in the last leg for your preparations but uh, you know some questions will come from biochemistry and uh, this uh, quick revision session sort of thing is there uh, which will help you uh, gather the relevant information for your mbs exam in the shortest possible time and the notes that you create in the class will be a very big help when you are finally revising uh, in the last few days for your exam when you are doing the recap in the last 2 3 days for all the subjects so there you'll be able to quickly go through these notes in maybe 45 to 50 minutes and that should uh, simplify the things for you as far as biochemistry is concerned and believe me majority of the questions from biochemistry are going to be covered in our discussion today as you know uh, biochemistry is a uh, uh, very directed specific uh, uh, topic in your exam limited questions from some of the very vital areas are being asked again and again and again so we'll focus on those areas and very very important i'll also highlight and focus on the concepts and uh, we'll also be doing some <coughs> questions so it is a mix of uh, you can say a revision program as well as a short uh, tnd sort of session will also be there because after every topic we'll be quickly looking at some of the uh, common and uh, important questions to uh, carry forward our discussion in the topic okay so i think uh, it's a good time to uh, start uh, uh, i am uh, okay i hope you are able to see the screen uh, which is being projected and uh, that is where i'll be making the annotation it has some content which i'll be relaying and in that content only i'll be annotating the additional information which you are required to know so let's start we'll discuss uh, the biochemistry under section so i'll start with uh, the most important section which you have to know in uh, view of the ongoing uh, pandemic uh, the covid crisis so we will uh, look at molecular biology first and carry on forward from there okay so let's let's start can we can we do the uh, uh, okay so first like i said we'll be covering the molecular biology 
and there are some very important definitions that you must know to uh, expand your understanding of the topic so what are purines and what are pyrimidines just note these are what are known as nitrogenous bases there are two subtypes of the nitrogenous bases and they are a part of the building block or that is the nucleotides so they are part of either you can say nucleoside or nucleotide i'm sure you know what a nucleoside nucleotide i'll come to that also okay so purine pyrimidine are the nitrogenous bases which are part of the building block that is nucleoside and the nucleotide then we have nucleoside in nucleoside we will have the nitrogenous base and this nitrogenous base is attached to the pentose sugar it is attached to the pentose sugar i'm sure you know if the rna is there we will have the ribose sugar if the dna is there we have the deoxyribose sugar okay so ribose and deoxyribose the deoxidation is at carbon 2 so 2 dash deoxyribose so in the nucleoside we will have a, an addition of the pentose sugar okay uh, so we get the nucleoside and then you get the nucleotide in the nucleotide what do we do nucleoside plus phosphate the number of phosphate can be 1 2 or 3 monocyte adenosine diphosphate triphosphate okay adenosine monophosphate diphosphate and triphosphate like that we have the number of phosphates which can be variable and once the phosphate is there which is attached to the nucleoside then we get the nucleotide so please keep in mind first the nitrous bases two types purine and pyrimidine when you attach the sugar then it becomes the nucleoside when you also attach the phosphate then it becomes the nucleotide okay so some very very important definitions here very frequently you get the question which of the following is present in nucleoside which of the following is not present in nucleoside all of the following are present in nucleotide except like that please note when we talk about two phosphates or the three phosphates they are different from the first phosphate they carry a lot of energy you can release that energy when you break the bond and therefore the second and third phosphate are uh, you, know, you can think of them as high energy phosphate all right you can think of them as the high energy phosphate okay that's uh, point number two and then very quickly you should know about the physiological functions here we are talking about the nucleotides what are the physiological functions of the nucleotide c this is an addition to the nucleotides being part of the dna and rna so obviously they are part of the dna and rna building block of dna and rna but in addition to that what all functions do the nucleotides perform that is a very common frequent question in the exam you should know like i said they function as what we call energy transducers and all of you know these examples atp gtp these are examples of the energy uh, transducers so they function as energy uh, transducers they function as energy transducers then they also work as second messengers you have heard about these molecules the cyclic amp the cyclic gmp so they function as what are known as second messengers in response to hormones some intermediate molecules are uh, released which will further propagate the action and influence of the hormones we call them as the second messengers so the nucleotides can also act as second messengers then they participate in what is known as the one carbon metabolism right they participate in what is known as the one carbon metabolism uh, the transfer of uh, carbon group from one molecule to another that is also carried out by the nucleotide sam is one of the two important transporters of the methyl group and then they can function as a coenzymes here you must have heard about the molecules nad nadp fmn fad so all of these are nucleotides nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide plevin mononucleotide plevin adenine dinucleotide so all of these are examples of uh, nucleotides so nucleotides also function as the coenzymes they are able to function as the coenzymes okay then they uh, 
they are also participating in the transport of sulfate right you don't need to remember this name i'm giving this name just to show you that the nucleotides also participate in the transport of the sulfate and they participate in the transport of the sugar derivatives they participate in the transport of sugar derivatives that is glucuronic acid is an example you know that when we are doing the conjugation with the bilirubin we have the udp glucuronic acid right so glucuronic acid is being transported by the nucleotide so they are also transporting the lipid derivatives and okay so what you can see here that a large number of additional functions being performed by the nucleotides and some of them are very very vital to the survival of the cell if the energy transducer function is not active then most of the cells will not be able to survive second messenger is very vital for the cells to interact with the, the uh, hormonal influence which is being exerted by the neurological system similarly one car metabolism is very 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 vital for large number of metabolic activities right so you can see a lot of very important physiological functions being carried out by nucleotide in addition to them being the part of the dna and the rna in addition to them being part of the dna and the rna Okay, so we move on to another point about the nucleotide. What you have to understand here, the purines and pyrimidines that we come across, they can be modified. When we modify them, they become nucleotide analogs. Addition of very small groups, maybe you are adding a fluoride, maybe you are adding some small groups. So they are called nucleotide analogs. They are slightly different from the routine nucleotides in the way that the routine nucleotide carrying the purine and pyrimidine when we ingest them orally they are degraded at the level what happened loss of connection just a second just a second my lonely screen my notebook share has gone just give me one second i'll restart my notebook share my notebook share has disappeared just a second is sure sorry for the disruption i'm very very sorry for this disruption okay here we have it here we go here we go let's see we are there yes so uh the dietary purines and pyrimidines are degraded at the level of the intestine they are not available to the body but if you do some modifications and we make what are known as the nucleotide analogs what are known as the nucleotide analogs they can be consumed and they are able to cross the mucosal barrier in the intestine and enter inside the body why these are important because they are used in management of large number of disorders for example, in uh, uh, chemotherapy, we are using the 5 fluorouracil we are using the 6 mercaptopurine, we are using the 6 azacitidine, all of these are used in the chemotherapy. Then for the treatment of gout, for the longest time, we have made use of allopurinol, which is also a nucleotide analog. Then for immune suppression, nowadays, we are using what is known as azathioprine for when you are doing the let's say organ transplant then you need to carry out the immune suppression then we are commonly using this molecule the azathioprine and for the anti-retroviral therapy okay so uh, the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors the nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors for the treatment of hiv infection all of them are also nucleoside and the nucleotide derivatives so these are some examples where the modified nucleotides are used in management of the large number of clinical conditions and last important point about nucleotides which you have to keep in mind is their interaction with uv light please note nucleotides will absorb the uv light all right they will absorb the ultraviolet light and uh, this uh, ultraviolet light is in the range of less than 400 nanometer if you have to mark the very specific wavelength which is absorbed by the nucleotides your answer should be 260 nanometer they absorb the uv light at 260 nanometer they also show what is known as hyperchromic effect what is hyperchromic effect 
due to uh, each of these strands of DNA uh, being capable of absorbing UV light, there is increase in absorption when you're using the double stranded DNA molecule after what we call as denaturation once you separate both the strands both the strands are able to absorb the uv light independently when they are together absorption is less when you separate both the strands the total absorption is more so when you are measuring the absorption you find that suddenly more more uv light is getting absorbed you call this the hyperchromic effect there is increase in absorption of the double stranded dna after you separate both the strands after you separate both the strands then the absorption increases what are the implications see one i already told you we are uh, measuring the absorption at 260 nanometers so this can be used for quantification a standard amount of uv light will be absorbed by a unit uh, weight of the nucleotide uh, whether it is dna or rna which can be used for the quantification and second, uh, because UV light will have lots of energy. Remember, we had read in our school that the light has dual nature, wave nature and the uh, particle nature. And there we had said, more is the wavelength, less is the energy. Less is the energy, more is the wavelength. So here we are dealing with something which is in the UV range. So UV range will have the very low wavelength. Therefore, it has lots of energy. This lots of energy can cause changes in the nucleotide sequence of the DNA and the RNA. We call this the mutagenic effect. So UV light has a mutagenic effect. That is why uh, when a uh, person is exposed to a lot of uh, light, to the sunlight, particularly those who have low, less pigmentation, they are likely to have more uh, incidence of skin cancer. Then there are individuals where the repair mechanisms are defective and again they are likely to have more episodes of the skin cancer and this is also a very important reason why we are worried about the ozone layer so if we have a layer in the atmosphere we call it the ozone layer which absorbs the uv light so that the uv light coming to the surface of the earth is much less in amount if this ozone layer is depleted more and more of uv light will start coming to the surface and because of its mutagenic effect it can cause very large amount of cancers that is the concern why we are worried about the ozone layer and how it translates into more episodes of the cancer so let's quickly move on to the dna when we talk about DNA, what you have to remember, currently we are talking about the B form of DNA. There are lots of conformation of the DNA. Most common conformation inside our body is the B form of DNA. In addition to this, what you have to note, this B form of DNA is actually the nuclear DNA. All right. So one is nuclear DNA. In addition to this, we also have a different place where the DNA is stored. We call it the mitochondrial DNA. So please keep in mind, we have DNA inside the nucleus. We have DNA inside the mitochondria. In addition to this, you should know that recently, uh, for in the last few years, we also started talking about what is known as the cell-free DNA. We started talking about what is known as the cell free dna the cell free dna is also being used in the diagnostics for example the cell free dna is used for what is known as liquid biopsy particularly for cancers it is also used for what is known as npt or NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing. This is being used more and more as a screening tool when we are trying to identify trisomies during the pregnancy in the uh, in, in the uterus or so in the fetus or the embryo when we are uh, trying to uh, find out whether the trisomy is there or not to take a call to carry the previous pregnancy forward or not. At that time, uh, previously we used to have the invasive test, the amniocentesis or the chronophilus sampling, which have a bit, some amount, although it is low, some amount of risk of loss of pregnancy. But here we are taking the sample from the mother. When we talk about the cell-free DNA during pregnancy, we are taking the sample from the mother and that blood is going to have some DNA from the fetus. 
the cells are being shed in the mother's blood so we can segregate that uh, fetal dna and we use it for identifying the incidence of trisomy the technique is called non-invasive prenatal testing i'll write it here this is known as non-invasive so you can write it as a n or an i p is for prenatal and t is for what is known as testing so non-invasive prenatal testing screening tool for measuring the trisomes okay so let's go back to the b form of the nuclear dna okay b form of the nuclear dna so here you have to know about the dimensions when i say dimension what do i mean what is the width of the structure what is the width of the structure and what type of bonds are there i'll just quickly show you so i'm sure if you know that the dna is a double stranded molecule right it is a double stranded molecule which you can see like this in this structure we have to identify two things One is the width of the helix, right? One is the width of the helix. So here you have to remember the width of the helix is two nanometer. If you're using the unit of nanometer, then it will be two. Or if you're using the unit of angstrom, in that case the answer will be twenty. The width of the helix is two nanometer or twenty angstrom. The second dimension that you have to identify is the distance occupied by one turn of dna the distance occupied by one turn of dna this is known as pitch the pitch of dna and this is approximately 34 armstrong or 3.4 nanometer 34 Armstrong or a 3.4 nanometer. All right. So pitch of the uh, DNA is the distance occupied by one turn, and for the B form, it is commonly described as 34 Armstrong or 3.4 nanometer, which contains 10 base pairs. It contains the 10 base pairs. So please note the question can ask what is the pitch of the DNA. Or it can ask how many nucleotides are present per return of DNA or how many nucleotides are present per pitch of the DNA or what is the distance occupied by one turn. So these are the different ways in which this question can be presented to you. You should be familiar about this. Okay. Now the two strands, the two strands of DNA are held together by the non-covalent hydrogen bonds. They are held together by non-covalent hydrogen bonds so this is another question which is commonly asked here you have to remember the bond between the two strands of dna the bond between the two strands of dna is <coughs> the hydrogen bond it is the non-covalent hydrogen bond this question has been asked multiple times so i'll tell you again please make note of this okay third thing which you have to keep in mind is this hydrogen bonding is between the nitrogenous bases right so the nitrogen bases face each other and they are linked via the hydrogen bonds however this pairing between the nitrogen bases is not random and it follows a pattern which is known as the chargaff rule i'm sure all of you know what is the chargaff rule in chargaff rule in the chargaff rule As you must be knowing, the adenine will pair with the thymine, A will pair with T, and the guanine will pair with cytosine, G will pair with C. So, A will pair with T, and G will pair with C. Okay, it seems today there is some lag in the internet. The connectivity is there, but it is not getting transmitted. Yeah, okay, okay, uh, it has been restored. It appears 
Okay, so adenine will pair with thymine and guanine will pair with cytosine. This is what is known as the Chargaff's rule. And you should remember, because of the Chargaff rule, the amount of adenine is equal to amount of thymine. The amount of guanine is equal to amount of cytosine inside the double-stranded DNA. Inside the double-stranded DNA, the amount of adenine and the amount of thymine is equal the amount of guanine the amount of cytosine is equal okay what else we already said the common form of dna is the b form of dna in addition to this we have the c d e and the a form of dna C, D, E, and the A form of DNA. Okay, uh, I'll just delete this. Okay. Okay, so uh, in the Z form of DNA, the second most common form of DNA, which is the Z form of DNA, in the Z form of DNA, we have 12 bases per turn. We have 12 bases per turn. The B form is described as right handed, it has the helical structure. Whereas the Z DNA is said to be left handed. This is another question which is commonly asked which of the following statement is true or false, like that will be correct. So, you have to remember the Z DNA is left handed. The Z DNA is left handed. The A DNA, on the other hand, is again right handed, is similar to the B form and it has 11 bases per turn. So, you can see different number of bases per turn is an important distinction between the different conformations of the DNA. I have already told you the uh, nucleotides uh, will make up the DNA and uh, the building blocks of this DNA are the nucleotides. Okay, the DNA synthesis process is known as replication which we will see shortly so remember replication is a dna synthesis and this replication is described as semi conservative semi conservative what do you mean by semi conservative if you look at the dna we have this double stranded dna like this when you want to carry out the replication, the two strands will separate out. The two strands will separate out and each of the strands will undergo the replication, right? Each of the strands will undergo the replication like this. And thus, the new DNA will be formed. Each of these strands will be the new DNA. But what do you find? that in this new DNA, one of these strands is actually the old strand. One of these strands is actually the old strand. So, half the structure has been conserved. It has been retained. That is why the replication is called semi-conservative. The process of replication is called semi-conservative, right? The process of replication is called semi-conservative. And last point which you have to keep in mind when you are talking about sorry when you're talking about the b form of dna is how do we further uh, describe the subunits or you can say the arrangement and the sections of the dna so the overall dna is known as a chromatin overall dna is known as chromatin in this overall dna we have what are known as u chromatin and the heterochromatin we have sections known as u chromatin and the heterochromatin right so one is u chromatin 
and the one is heterochromatin. So wherever the transcription is going on, means wherever the RNA synthesis is ongoing, that section is called the euchromatin. In the segment of DNA where transcription is not happening, we call this as the heterochromatin, it is between euchromatin and heterochromatin, right? The uh, heterochromatin uh, can behave uh, in different manners. The heterochromatin can behave in different manners. For example, it may always remain as non transcribed or sometimes it may get transcribed but under special conditions. So based on this nature, heterochromatin can either be facultative, sometimes gets transcribed, it can either be facultative or it can be what is known as constitutive. When I say constitutive, what this means that this type of DNA is never getting a transcript so you can have the facultative or the constitutive heterochromatin what you have to remember the constitutive heterochromatin if you try to visualize them under in the dna after the staining pattern is in there so you can get segments which are called satellites and which are called which are called I'll write here only micro satellites so satellites and micro satellites are the subtypes of the constitutive heterochromatin you remember this term the satellites and micro satellites are the subtype of the constitutive heterochromatin okay so uh, the chromatin is the arranged form of the dna and it can be called the euchromatin or the heterochromatin euchromatin where the transcription is happening the heterochromatin where transcription is not happening some heterochromatin are always heterochromatin some of them can transcribe under special conditions so we can have the facultative heterochromatin or we can have the constitutive heterochromatin where we use the term satellite and the micro satellite and then we come to the very important uh, second location of DNA I told you we have what is known as the mitochondrial DNA right what do you know about what you should know about mitochondrial DNA first thing if you look at the uh, transcription and translation from mitochondrial DNA there is some difference in the genetic code okay for example the UGA which is normally a stop codon gets transcribed as tryptophan the AGA and AGG which are normally for arginine are read as the co stop codon. AUG which is normally read as methionine. This is read as this is read as a formyl methionine. It is read as formyl methionine. And lastly, AUA. Normally, it will read as isoleucine. Normally, it will read as isoleucine. But in the mitochondria, it will read as methionine. Okay, so there are some differences that we see in the mitochondrial DNA in comparison to the nuclear DNA. In addition to this, you should remember that mitochondrial DNA is actually quite small. Okay, how small? It has only 1, 6, 5, 6, 9 base pairs. So it is very, very, very small. Second thing, what you have to keep in mind is the mitochondrial DNA is circular in the arrangement whereas the nuclear dna nuclear dna is linear it is a linear whereas the mitochondrial dna is circular although both of them are double stranded in nature and in addition to this mitochondrial dna codes for 37 genes it codes for 37 genes 
of this 13 proteins we get the 13 proteins each of them belongs to the electron transport chain we get the two ribosomal rna we get two ribosomal rna and the remaining 22 are the transfer rna so these are the products which are coming from the mitochondrial dna 13 protein all belong to electron transport chain the two ribosomal rna and the 22 transfer rna which are obtained from the mitochondrial dna in addition to this almost all of the dna is getting translated we have very few untranslated sequences very very few untranslated sequences and lastly the mutation rate is significantly high in comparison to the nuclear dna the mutation rate is significantly high okay in addition to these points about the mitochondrial DNA, what else you should know? We should know about the inheritance pattern, how the mitochondrial DNA is inherited. If you look at the inheritance pattern, it is quite unique from uh, the other inheritance pattern because here the mitochondrial DNA follows a very peculiar route of inheritance. What happens here? The In case of mitochondrial inheritance, mother will transfer the mitochondria to all offsprings. Whether it is male, whether it is female, it does not matter. All the offsprings will get the mitochondria from the mother. But if you talk about a father, none of the offsprings. None of the offsprings will get the mitochondria from the father. So, mother will give the uh, mitochondria to all the offsprings. Father will not give the mitochondria to any of the offsprings. Because of this, we have very peculiar inheritance pattern. So, you can see here, female is affected. And in the next generation, we said mother will transmit to all offsprings. So, this disease will spread to all the offsprings you can see it will spread to both the offsprings here you can see one male is affected and one female is affected so we said the father cannot transmit the disease so when we see the inheritance we will see all the offsprings will be normal whereas mother will again cause a disease in all the offsprings you can see here father does not uh, transmit the disease whereas mother is again transmitting disease to all the offsprings and the same pattern can be seen generation after generation meaning only the mother will transmit the disease the father cannot transmit the disease this is the peculiarity of the inheritance pattern of the mitochondrial dna disorders so you should know some of the names of the mitochondrial inherited disorders these include the deafness mellitus and deafness leber hereditary optic neuropathy the leg syndrome which presents at some acute sclerosing encephalopathy the narp neuropathy ataxia retinitis pigmentosa and ptosis the myoneurogenic gastrointestinal encephalopathy the MRF, myoclonic epilepsy with red, red fibers and by far the most common and the most important, the most common and the most important uh, disorder in the mitochondrial disease that is the MELAS. MELAS, MELAS stands for the mitochondrial myopathy, the encephalomyopathy, the lactic acidosis and lastly the stroke like symptoms so they present typically to the emergency with stroke like symptoms syncope episodes can be there uh, but when you do the scanning you don't find anything okay so stroke like symptoms can be there or at the same time when you try to find out the history and clinical history for these patients you do the biochemical lab test then the other pictures will come out what all other disorders are there we have the chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia we have the Kearns-Sears syndrome and we have the 
Pearson syndrome and lastly we have the infantile myopathy and the lactic cirrhosis. So these are some of the well-known mitochondrial related disorders. Don't forget the very typical inheritance pattern that we have shown you and all these patients will have one common feature. What is that common feature? That common feature is they will present with what is known as lactic acidosis. Why? Remember I told you the mitochondrial DNA codes for the protein of the electron transport chain. So any problem in the mitochondrial DNA, then the electron transport chain will start working less efficiently. All right, it will start working less efficiently. And the result of which we are likely to have what is known as the lactic acidosis. So this is about the mitochondrial DNA and the mitochondrial inherited disorders. Then we move on to RNA. In case of RNA, what you have to remember inside the prokaryote, inside the prokaryote, we have only one type of the RNA polymerase, which makes the RNA. We have only one type of RNA polymerase. On the other hand, on the other hand. If you talk about the uh, eukaryotic, eukaryotic or the uh, nuclear uh, uh, RNA polymerase, here we have the multiple types of RNA polymerase, type 1, type 2, type 3, so different types of RNA polymerase there. What you have to keep in mind, most of the important RNA synthesized by RNA polymerase 2, the messenger RNA coming from coming from the heterogeneous nuclear RNA, the MI or the micro RNA, SN or the small nuclear RNA, SN or the small nuclear RNA. Okay. Rarely you can get the question about the transfer RNA. So you should remember transfer RNA synthesized by the RNA polymerase 2. Transfer RNA, why? Because a lot of questions have been asked previously. It has a very peculiar structure. It has multiple well-defined functions uh, within its ambit. That is why the transfer RNA is asked again and again. Let's look at this transfer RNA. This transfer RNA, as you must be knowing, has multiple arms. It has multiple arms and uh, one of those arms is T psi CM. What the T psi CM does? It binds the amino cell tRNA to the ribosomal surface. It binds amino cell tRNA to the ribosomal surface. What about DM? DM recognizes the correct amino cell tRNA synthetase. This amino cell tRNA synthetase in turn will synthesize the amino acyl tRNA so that the correct amino acyl tRNA is now available. It can come and get attached to the transfer RNA. At where? Where will it get attached? It will get attached at the acceptor arm. It will get attached at the acceptor arm. Now this is the site of attachment of the specific amino acids. This is the site of attachment of the specific amino acid. So if you look at the structure, this is only a representative structure. This is not as per the scale. Okay, so the amino acid, let's say amino acid is getting attached here. That is the acceptor arm. But what you have to understand, this tRNA has to finally go and attached at the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA where we have the codons, the three nuclei described in the codon. So that surface of the tRNA which interacts with the codon on messenger RNA, that which interacts with codon on messenger RNA, we call this as the anticodon region. It is called the anticodon region, which recognizes the three letter codon on the messenger RNA. It recognizes the three letter codon on the messenger RNA. Okay, so we have the four well defined arms the T psi CR, the D arm, the acceptor arm, and the anticodon region.
in addition to this we have an extra which is the most variable feature of the transfer RNA. Interestingly, this extra arm doesn't have any well-defined function, doesn't have any well-defined function. Lastly, uh, the secondary structure in the two dimensions, I'll write it here. Secondary structure in two dimensions appears like a clover leaf structure, but in three dimensions it resembles the letter L. It resembles an inverted L shape. So you have to read the question very, very carefully. They will ask you about the uh, appearance or the secondary structure of the transfer RNA, and very quickly you are likely to mark. You are likely to mark the clover leaf structure, right? Please remember you have to read whether we are talking about the uh, two dimensional structure or we are talking about the three dimensional structure. Based on that, the answer will change. In three dimensional structure, the answer will be the inverted L shape, whereas in the two dimensional structure, the answer will be the clover leaf structure. So these are some of the very, very important critical properties of the transfer RNA. Very repeatedly, we'll get the questions on the transfer RNA. Then we have what is known as the post transcriptional modification which is carried out for the heterogeneous nuclear RNA as a result of which this HNRNA will get converted into the messenger RNA, right? So HNRNA undergoes the post transcription modification as a result of which it will get converted into the messenger RNA. So what do you find? Number one, there is capping. Capping means addition of 7 methyl guanosine at the 5 dash end. Addition of 7 methyl guanosine at 5 dash end. Second is the poly A tail. Poly A tail, if you carry out the translation, if you carry out translation, it will get converted into the poly lysine. But here also, the poly A is attached at the 3 dash end okay because the genetic code contains large number of structures known as introns introns are those components of the dna which are not getting translated so what we have to do when you're making the messenger rna you have to remove these introns the introns are removed and subsequently the exons are joined together okay so now that we have talked about a little bit about the dna rna how the dna is getting converted into rna and subsequently we know that RNA, this rna which has been formed will finally get converted into the protein so when we look at this transformation from the genet uh, from the sequence of nucleotide you are getting converted into the sequence of amino acid we find that there is there is a certain pattern in this uh, conversion in this conversion there is a certain certain pattern we call that pattern as the genetic code this is how the whole story is raveling okay this is how the whole story is raveling we call it the genetic code surprisingly when you compare the genetic code of the different organisms on this planet earth you'll come to know that genetic code among all organisms is very 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 similar there may be minor differences of even less than one percent but majority of the genetic code in the organisms is exactly similar so what are the points in the genetic code number one genetic code is a triplet code means we have to have the three nucleotide 
we have to have the three influids to make up the genetic code the number of the am I, uh, the needle transition go inside the box may be different or it may be limited but we design the genetic code in the way that the needle drives can okay then we say that the genetic code is degenerate please try to understand in the genetic code we have 64 stop codons we have sorry, 64 codons in total what are these 64 codons three are stop codons so we are left with the 61 codons and what do you know here these 61 codons are going to code only for 20 different amino acids obviously multiple codons will be affiliated to uh, the single amino acid this is what we call as a degeneracy the genetic code is degenerate it shows degeneracy means multiple codons code for the same amino acid multiple codons code for the same amino acid at the same time it is unambiguous when i say unambiguous what this means if you have let's say the nucleotide codon like this a u g c a let's say again again a and then you say that okay i'm reading the codons this is codon number one and this should be codon number two but i think c it should not be the starting nucleotide so what we can do we can take the nucleotide from the previous codon and then make up the nucleotide this is wrong the one marked in green is wrong once the nucleotide has been used for a codon it cannot be used for the next nucleotide this is what we mean by the genetic code is unambiguous the nucleotides uh, are non-overlapping and non-punctuated okay so first we said triplet code then we said degenerate multiple codons for same amino acid then we said unambiguous every time the translation will happen we'll get the same amino acid and non-overlapping this is what i told you non-overlapping the same nucleotide cannot be used for multiple codons at the same time we cannot leave gaps if there is a new nucleotide coming due to insertion or one of the nucleotides has got mutated you cannot ignore that nucleotide we have to read it in continuation without any breaks so we can also call this what is known as um, commonless the genetic code is commonless and lastly i told you in the beginning the genetic code is universal among all the organisms the genetic code is universal because we have only three stop codons they have been given a certain nomenclature in the scientific literature please make note of this the uag uag is described as amber uag is described as amber uaa is described as Ochre. UAA is described as ochre and lastly UGA is described as open. You may or may not remember these names. These are sometimes rarely asked by your old old examiners. They can try to trip you by asking these questions. The last point here which you should be familiar with is the mutation. What are the different types of mutation that we should know about? So what can happen here is the base substitution one nucleotide taken out and replaced by another nucleotide this is called the base mutation in the base mutation we see transition and transversion what do you mean by transition one purine will get converted into the another purine whereas one pyrimidine will get converted into the another pyrimidine this is what is known as a transition but nowadays if you look more commonly we see the transversion here what is happening there is a cross link purine going for pyrimidine purine going for pyrimidine or the pyrimidine going for purine so 
these are the base substitution in frame substitution uh, you remove one nucleotide so the whole reading frame will shift you remove two nucleotides again the whole reading frame will shift but if you have three nucleotides the reading frame will be intact Let's look at some uh, very basic uh, questions to enhance your understanding of the topic. Okay. So, first question. Nucleoside is made of, of all, except I told you this type of question will come in your exam. Very frequently we get this type of question. So here you have to remember nucleoside is made of all except what is the answer that you're going to mark? Please send your answers in the telegram group. I'm telling the answers. First question of our session, the nucleoside is made up of all of the following except what is your answer? Quickly send the answers in the telegram group. I hope all of you are also there on the telegram group. Send your answers on the telegram group. Nucleoside is made up of the pyrimidine, sugar, histone, purine. Which of them is not actually a part of the nucleoside? Hurry up, hurry up, send your answers, send your answers quickly. Just write 1, 2, 3, 4. That should be enough. You can write 1, 2, 3, 4. No need to copy the whole answer. Okay, so remember the purine and the pyrimidine, they are nitrogen based. They have to be present in both nucleoside and the nucleotide. We said nucleoside will have the nitrogen base plus the pentose sugar. This means the correct answer should be histone. Very good. Some of you have sent the answer. Remember, the histone will be the correct answer. It is present in the chromatin structure. It is not present in the nucleoside or the nucleotide level. It is present in the chromatin uh, structure. Question number two. You can see here, question number two. Concentration of the DNA is measured by. Concentration of DNA is measured by. I told you this information. Please send in your answers. Wait, I'll wait for one minute. Send in your answers. I'm waiting for your answers. Okay. Infrared examination has no role in measurement of uh, DNA. Ultrasound examination doesn't have any role in measurement of a DNA. How are you going to estimate the deoxyribose and will it very clearly give us the concentration of DNA? Yes, it can give, but we are not able to measure the deoxyribose. So I told you how we are doing the quantification. Quanti quantification means we are talking about the concentration. When I say quantification, it means we are talking about the concentration. So the correct answer is absorption of UV light at 260 nanometer. Very good, very good. I can see some of you have tried. Wonderful. See, don't worry about giving a wrong answer, right? Here, it doesn't matter whether you're giving the wrong answer or the right answer. We are trying to learn. Making mistake here is well and good as long as you're making an attempt to do the quick revision with me. So don't worry about the correct or incorrect answer. What we're going to do is uh, try to understand and try to enhance this understanding. So another question, two strands of DNA are held together by, two strands of DNA are held together by the answer. What is the answer? What is the answer this time? The two strands of DNA are held together by Van der Waal bond, the hydrogen bond, the covalent bond or the ionic interaction. Which of these is the correct answer? Van der Waal bond, hydrogen bond, covalent bond or the ionic interaction? I already told you the answer. I'm sure all of you know this answer. The correct answer is obviously the hydrogen bond. This is the bond which is there between the nitrogenous bases. I told you when the double stranded structure is there in between them, the hydrogen bond, the non covalent hydrogen bond is there which is holding the two strands of a DNA together. The two strands of DNA are held together with the help of non covalent hydrogen bonds. Okay. Look at the options here very, very carefully and then tell us which of the following options is the correct Chargaff rule. As per Chargaff rule, which of the following options is correct? 
remember I told you the as per Charkov rule A pairs with T and G pairs with C right we are told that A pairs with T and the G pairs with C if you look at both sides this is the purines this is the purines and if you look at this side this is the pyrimidine so what this means the amount of purine is equal to the amount of pyrimidine in double strand dna as per the chargaff rule right so look here a plus g is the purine t plus c is the pyrimidine so now uh, there's a big problem how you're going to attempt the question if this uh, question the exam a lot of permutation combinations are possible so i'll give you a trick label this equation as one label this equation as two and whenever you get the question for comparison between the charga rule you replace the values accordingly for example the options are a plus t is equal to g plus c let us see a a is 1 t t is also 1 1 plus 1 is equal to g is 2 and c is 2 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 plus 2 the question is saying 2 is equal to 4 true or false question is saying a 2 is equal to 4 true or false no this is false this is not correct similarly a is 1 u is 1 t is 1 but g and c are 2 so this conversion or comparison is not correct so option 3 is also not correct let's look at a upon g a is 1 g is 2 and then c upon t so what the question is trying to tell us is 1 upon 2 is equal to 2 is this true or false this is definitely wrong this is definitely wrong so option 2 is also wrong we already said that option 1 is correct why because purine equal to pyrimidine purine are a plus d pyrimidine are t plus c c here we have just calculated amount of purine is equal to amount of pyrimidine in double stranded dna this will not be applicable if you're talking about the single stranded rna or the single strand dna this will be applicable only 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 in the case of the double stranded molecule please remember the charga rule and the shortcut that i told you how to do the calculation when it comes to the content of purine and the pyrimidine okay whether the given equation is correct or incorrect very important question at physiological ph the dna molecules are positively charged negatively charged neutral amphipathic the answer is in the name if you remember the full form of dna what is the dna dna is deoxyribonucleic acid so acid at the physiological ph will be it will be negatively charged remember the DNA molecule at the physiological ph will be negatively charged so there is some ambiguity in the options here for example amphipathic dna is also amphipathic but uh, when you're talking about the ph this amphipathic nature doesn't come into the play when you're talking about ph this amphipathic nature doesn't come into the play which form of dna is predominantly seen i told you b followed by z followed by a followed by c d and e which form of dna is predominantly seen the answer should be the b form of dna b form of dna is a predominantly seen okay so correct answer is d the b form of dna okay look at the structure what is the nature of bond between the two natural bases on opposite strands or double strand dna you already done this question just now the answer answer in this case is again the hydrogen bond so you can see image based question can also be asked from the simple straight one line questions they can be converted into the image form by showing the information in the form of image we get the double stranded dna held together by hydrogen bond. very good again i'll repeat don't worry about your answers whether they're right or wrong please attempt the question see if you attempt the question you make a mistake you'll remember 
that I made this mistake. So when that question comes in the exam, you know that at least this particular option cannot be the answer because I had given this answer in the class and it was wrong. So it doesn't matter whether your answer is right or wrong. If you give the answer, you're still learning. Okay. And that's what we are doing here. We're trying to learn. So don't hesitate to mark the answer. Here, the right and wrong is not important. Okay, so this question is sometimes asked, intron is not found in which gene I told you, DNA commonly has introns, introns have to be removed. But what you have to remember in the mitochondrial DNA and in the prokaryotic DNA, in the prokaryotic DNA, the introns are not there. Splicing is not required, you don't need to remove the introns, join together, and so on, whatever is available, whatever is available is uh, quickly getting translated so in mitochondrial dna or in the prokaryotes the intron is not found okay the protein rich in basic amino acid which function in packaging of dna in chromosome is this question will be more suitable once you have done the amino acid but because this is a revision i am hoping you know this what is the correct answer here anyone the protein rich in basic amino acid which functions in the packaging of DNA in chromosome. What is the correct answer? Is it elastin? Is it collagen? Is it histones? Is it fibrinogen? What is the correct answer? Very quickly send in your answers. Come on, come on. Okay, I can see some answers already flowing here. Okay, send them fast, send them fast. As you have correctly marked, the answer is histones. Very good. Histone are rich in the basic amino acids. Which of the amino acids are there in large amount? Lysine and arginine. These are some of the very important basic amino acids. They are present in histone in large amount. So histone is uh, positively charged. It will attract the negatively charged DNA so that they can form the common structure. Okay. So remember which function in packaging of DNA, they must have the opposite in nature to the DNA, only then they will be attracted towards each other, right? Okay, you can the region of DNA that is relatively, here you have to mark the answer uncondensed. For you to what you have to remember? Number one, it is uncondensed, it is lightly staining. Okay, euchromatin is uncondensed, it is lightly staining and the euchromatin is what we have already mentioned, transcriptionally active. What this means, this is the site where the RNA synthesis is ongoing, where the RNA synthesis is ongoing. So remember euchromatin is lightly staining, it is uncondensed and it is transcriptionally active. Heterochromatin will be just opposite in all the points. Heterochromatin will be just opposite in all the points. How come? The heterochromatin will be darkly staining. It will be transcriptionally inactive and it is in comparison quite condensed. Okay, it is condensed. Okay. Inheritance pattern of multiple DNA, horizontal, vertical, paternal, maternal. Here I will not wait for your answers. I have just told you. I have, we have discussed this previously. The multiple DNA is having the maternal inheritance. The mother will transmit the uh, mitochondria to all the offspring. So here the answer should be maternally inherited. Non-coding RNA are all except... So this is called a double negative type of question. We start with a negative phrase and at the end we again write a negative phrase. So this is called a double negative question. Very simple way to attempt this question. You remove both the negative components. So whenever you have multiple negative statements, you take out one pair. Why? Why? We know from our classes when you have two minus, it becomes a plus sign. So take out both the negatives and then you get the simple question. Which of the RNA are coding RNA? Which of the RNA are coding RNA? Now your question is very simple. You know the coding RNA is the messenger RNA. Coding RNA is only the messenger RNA. All other uh, RNA are non-coding in nature. All other 
are in a, are non coding in nature they have biological functions but they cannot get translated into the protein the rna which gets directly translated into the protein is the messenger rna okay so uh, some additional question from rna the role of the micro rna mi stands for the micro rna so here you have to remember the role is regulation of gene expression the micro rna is a very very strong regulator of gene expression one single micro rna is able to regulate the expression of 50 to 100 different genes one single uh, micro rna is able to regulate the functioning of 50 to 100 different genes so whenever we have the introns we have to remove those introns those introns are removed by the phenomena called the splicing the splicing in turn is done by the snrna please note snrna are also known as ribozymes they function as enzyme but they are not protein in nature they are rna in nature okay so remember this snrna this molecular rna function as ribozymes they participate in the phenomena of splicing the mutation in the codon which causes a change in the coded amino acid is miss sense mutation so here when we are talking about the base substitution or the point mutation where we said we can have the transition or we can have the transversion right so what are the possibilities what are the possibilities when you are doing this change first you can have the silent mutation silent mutation means you have substituted the nucleotide but the protein you are getting is still the same You can get the miss sense mutation. What do we know? Miss sense one amino acid is changed. One amino acid is changed, or you can get the non sense mutation. Here, what is happening? The nucleotide has changed as a result of which we have the stop codon. When the stop codon is there, it cannot get translated, it cannot ma make any sense for any of the transfer RNA. So then we will have uh, the uh, uh, termination, the uh, process of transcription will stop there only, uh, sorry, process of replication will stop there only. We call this the non-sense mutation. Here you should also note the change brought about by missense mutation may be acceptable it may be partially acceptable or it may be unacceptable so all this depends on the effect on the biological function if there is no change in biological function there is no change in physical chemical properties we call it acceptable if there is change in uh, physical chemical properties but no change in the biological function so if you have the same biological function we call it partially acceptable and in unacceptable there is loss of the biological function there is a loss of biological function we call it the unacceptable miss sense mutation very commonly the question is asked about hps because hps is the most common abnormal variant of the hemoglobin so here you have to remember the chain is occurring at position 6 of beta chain in the a helix in the a helix where the glutamic acid is replaced by valine so glutamic acid is getting replaced by valine in the hbs so what is happening normally what happens this glutamic acid because of its acidic nature it will repel the negatively charged components of another hemoglobin but the valine doesn't have any charge it is a neutral it doesn't have any charge so it is not able to repel the components of the hemoglobin which are having the negative charge and it joins together we call this phenomena as sickling i'm sure you know this sickling is due to presence of the hbs where the change is occurring at position 6 of beta chain in the A helix. There are 7 helices A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Out of those uh, in the A helix at position 6 of beta chain, the 
a change from glutamic acid to valine is occurring. Okay, which of the following is not a feature of the genetic code? I showed a genetic code just 15 minutes back. How many of you can mark the correct answer? How many of you can mark the correct answer? Your time starts now. I'll wait for 30 seconds for your answer. Which of the following is not a feature of the genetic code? You have only 30 seconds to mark the correct answer. Send in your answers in the Telegram group very, very quickly. Okay, okay. Please note, please note, we have said the genetic code is degenerate. This is correct. The genetic code is degenerate. We also said the genetic code is non overlapping. The genetic code is not punctuated. But we should remember the genetic code is unambiguous. The genetic code is unambiguous. So if you write ambiguous, then it is not the correct statement. The ambiguous nature is not present in the genetic code. Unambiguous nature unambiguous nature is present in the genetic code very good i can see some of you are regularly sending in the answers and uh, very happily those are even the correct answers of it doesn't matter whether the answers are correct or incorrect but i can see some of you are regularly attempting and request others who are not attempting to kindly keep attempting the questions okay risk is the active complex of the micro rna it is the active complex of microRNA and risk stands for RNA induced silencing complex it is called RNA induced silencing complex okay so this is the component which is participating in the regulation of the gene expression once the mature microRNA is going to the cytoplasm will join the proteins this whole complex will be the risk RNA induced silencing complex plus the micro RNA together it will form the risk. So in this Drosha is required, Pasha is required, the dicer is required, ribozyme is not required. Ribozyme is required during the formation of the peptide chain. It is required during the splicing. Okay. Also note Pasha is also known as a DGCR8. So, in the question in the exam, in place of Pasha, the term DGCR8 may also be written. Remember, Drosha, Pasha, also known as DGCR8, and Dicer are involved in the changing or activating of the microRNA. We will not go into the details of that synthetic pathway, but just remember these points. Okay, so with this image, uh, uh, we'll take a very short break for uh, 5 to 10 minutes. You can just stretch your limbs, use the washroom, have a glass of water or you can bring in your cup of coffee and then we'll start again. In the meantime, take a look at this picture and try to tell me what exactly are we looking at. Alright, so very short break here, 5 to 10 minutes, just stretch your wing and I'll drop in the message in the telegram group before I start.
Am I audible? Am I audible? Now am I audible? Can you hear me now? Am I audible now? Can you hear me now? Am I audible? My screen says yes, but I want to know from you whether you can hear me. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, so so tell us what are we seeing in this image? What can you see in this image? What is it? What does it show and which condition uh, will present in this manner? Anyone? So what you have to note in this image is the bite marks on the fingers and the lip nibbling nibbling you can see on the fingers and on the lip at the same time at the same time you can uh -huh. at the same time you can also see teeth marks on the hands teeth marks on the hands there's a lag for the screen just uh, hold a few seconds while the screen is getting stuck the lag for the screen we are waiting for the lag to disappear mm -hmm. okay i think it should be better now and this is the lesh nihan syndrome if you don't know this this is the lesh nihan syndrome uh what happened transmission is okay but we're not getting it on the screen mm -hmm. should i yeah now we got okay so we are looking at the lesh nahan syndrome you can see the nibbled fingers and the lips and the teeth mark the bite mark on the hands these are characteristic of the lesh nahan syndrome very characteristic of lesh nahan syndrome so let's quickly see what is lesh nahan syndrome we have questions on lesh nahan syndrome frequently in your exam uh, one is the image you should be able to identify from the image that we are looking at the lesh nihan syndrome number one is that number two is okay number two is what are the features what are the features that you should be able to identify in this case okay You can see we'll we'll use a question to identify how the question how it can be presented so question can be like this a 10 year old child with aggressive behavior and poor concentration is brought with presenting complaints of joint pain and reduced urinary output mother gives history of self mutilative behavior stating that he tends to mutilate his finger so this question has large number of the signs and symptoms which will be there in a patient of the lesh nahan syndrome i'll quickly mark out okay uh, sometimes in the question instead of child it can be boy why this point is important because the inheritance pattern is x linked recessive so most of the time the patient will be a boy inheritance pattern is x linked recessive aggressive behavior is an important feature aggressive behavior is an important feature of the lesh nahan syndrome poor concentration is provided to explain that the patient has mental retardation another feature of these patients is presence of mental retardation the joint pain indicates the presence of gout joint pain indicates the presence of gout and the reduced urinary output indicates the renal stones okay it represents the renal stones and we already said the most characteristic feature is the self mutilating tendency the most important feature is the self mutilating tendency 
and then the question can be like this the same question can be there for the image the same question can be there for the clinical case for any of these two cases you can have the same uh, last line of the question which of the following enzymes is likely to be deficient in uh, this uh, patient so remember the Lishman syndrome is due to the complete absence of the enzyme HGPRTs. It is due to complete absence of the enzyme HGPRTs. So let's summarize all this information in one single slide and you can quickly note down those points. Three major clinical elements in the uh, features. Number one is increased uric acid. So because of increased uric acid, what all can you have? You can have the gout, you can have the renal stones and what is known as tophi. Tophi is swelling around the joints because of the deposits of the uric acid. Okay, so increased uric acid can present like this. Then you can have the mental retardation and you can have what is known as dystonia dystonia means the tone disorder is there tone disorder is there okay and the third one third one we have already seen in the question aggressive behavior along with the self mutilation tendency aggressive behavior with the self mutilation tendency okay these are the three major clinical elements <clears throat> the first one is the first one is biochemical oh it got deleted so we have the biochemical features the neurological features and lastly we said the psychiatric features we mentioned these points okay in it is pattern i told already told you it is x-linked inheritance pattern an enzymatic defect there is absence of the enzyme hgprts absence of the enzyme hgprts in leshnahan variant the enzyme is decreased also known as the kelly sieg miller syndrome the condition is known as the kelly sieg miller syndrome okay so a gprt is if it is decreased then we get the leshnan variant called the kelly sieg miller syndrome if it is absent then we get the condition lesh nihan syndrome okay so please keep this point in mind okay so now we quickly go on to the dna synthesis then we'll talk about the protein synthesis etc these are the points which are we are going to cover so when you talk about the DNA synthesis, the points to keep in mind, the point to keep in mind is how the process of, uh, how the process of the DNA replication is uh, happening, how the process of DNA replication is happening. Okay, let's see. So first and foremost, uh, the story is the DNA is a very long molecule from where we are going to start the replication. So first step is identification of the origin of replication. This origin of replication is known as ORI. ORI are 80 rich regions. All right. So in prokaryotes, in prokaryotes, the AT rich region is only one in number. So we have a single ORI. Whereas in uh, uh, eukaryotes, in eukaryotes, because the DNA is much longer, a single ORI is not able to uh, complete the process of uh, replication. We require the multiple ORI. So what is ORI? ORI is the AT rich region. Please note that ORI includes it includes both the strands it is not just one strand it includes both the strands it includes both the strands okay so first the identification of origin of replication is there this identification is done by the protein called ORI binding protein 
और दी ओरी रेस्पॉन्स एलिमेंट ओ बी पी स्टैंड फॉर ओरी बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन एन ओ आर ई स्टैंड फॉर द ओरी रेस्पॉन्स एलिमेंट सो देविल आइडेंटिफाई द ओरी देविल गेट अटैच द ओरी एंड दे विल कैरी आउट द इनिशियल सेपरेशन ऑफ द ओरी सो इनिशियल सेपरेशन इज डन बाय ओरी एंड दिस सेपरेशन इज स्टेबिलाईज बाय द सिंगल स्ट्रैंड बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन सो वट विल हैपन दिस डी एन ए इज देयर where we have this ori this is the at rich region so ori binding protein will come ori binding protein will come and it will cause the denaturation so what will happen the dna will separate like this this dna will separate like this so we have this ओरी बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन और दी ओरी रेस्पॉन्स एलिमेंट ओके दिस स्टेबिलाईजेशन इज स्टेबिलाईज बाय सॉरी दिस सेपरेशन इज स्टेबिलाईज बाय अनदर सेट ऑफ प्रोटीन्स विच वी सेट इज द सिंगल स्ट्रैंड बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन एज सुन एज द टू स्ट्रैंड सेपरेटेड दे बिकम सिंगल स्ट्रैंडेड इन दैट पर्टिकुलर रीजन एंड देर द सिंगल स्ट्रैंड बाइंडिंग प्रोटीन विल कम इन एट दिस पॉइंट द फर्दर सेपरेशन इज कैरीड आउट बाय अनदर प्रोटीन called the helicase further separation is carried out by another protein called the helicase we always have a pair of helicases working simultaneously in both the directions we have a pair of helicases working simultaneously in both the direction all right when the uh, helicase is causing the unwinding it also causes what is known as torsional strain the torsional strain if it is not relieved it will cause super coiling so we have to relieve this torsional strain and the torsional strain is relieved by the topo isomerase so first we start with ori binding protein after ori binding protein we have the single strand binding protein then we have the helicase and helicase is uh, working simultaneously with the topo isomerase topo isomerase is working uh, uh, you can say ahead of the helicase so at this point we get a <coughs> structure something like this this is the ori ori binding protein will come and get attached and it will cause the denaturation the single strand binding protein will come and get attached the further separation is carried out by the helicase once the helicase has acted upon this the helicase is acting here you can see we have the helicase here it is causing the separation at this point the polymerase comes into the picture the polymerase will carry out the function along with another enzyme called the primase let's quickly see what are the functions of polymerase and primase primase will make the primer polymerase pri primase will make the primer this primer is rna in a nature so this structure is required to extend in the form of dna the dna polymerase cannot make the initial segment so initial segment has to be rna in nature we need a different enzyme which in this case is the primase so you can see the primase is there in the green color uh, in uh, tri the triangle this is drawn here this is the uh, primase the triangle which is drawn here is the primase just a second uh -huh. so this is this is the primase which is here so primase is synthesizing the primer which is rna in nature and this rna is then extended it is then extended to uh, in the form of the dna and this dna will be formed by the polymerase this dna will be formed by the polymerase okay so what we see we see two things on one side we get the continuous synthesis you can see on one side we get the continuous synthesis right on one side we get the continuous synthesis on the other side you can see the small fragments are being made small fragments are being made so on other side we get the this 
continuous we get the discontinuous synthesis when we get the continuous synthesis we call it as the leading strand we label this as the leading strand on the other hand where we get the discontinuous synthesis we label this as the lagging strand so we have the leading strand and we have the lagging strand leading and the lagging strand okay on the lagging strand you can see there are fragments where the yellow part is there and the black part is there this is having both dna and rna this part which is in yellow the part which is in yellow this is rna structure the part which is in black is the dna structure so you can see fragments containing both fragments containing both dna and rna you can see the fragments containing both dna and rna right these fragments are known as okazaki fragments these fragments are known as okazaki fragments very very important question very commonly asked what do you remember here okazaki fragments will be found on the lagging strand where the discontinuous synthesis is there in okazaki fragment we have both dna and rna the very common question okazaki fragment is made up of so here you have to remember the okazaki fragment is made up of both dna and rna very very commonly asked question okay so what do you see here we have a strand where continuous dna synthesis is happening we have a strand where bits and pieces of the dna are being formed we call it the lagging strand so this is being done by the primase and the polymerase subsequent this polymerase which is functioning here is actually the polymerase 3 so polymerase 3 is carrying out the primary synthesis but when the replication process is complete we don't get fragments of dna we get the final complete structure of the dna right we get the final complete structure of the dna so they, we have to remove these small fragments which are there these small fragments are removed by these small fragments are removed by the dna polymerase 1 the dna polymerase 1 will perform two functions what does it do number 1 it will remove the primer okay it will cleave out the primer it will delete the primer and this empty space is replaced by a dna segment the empty space is replaced by the dna segment so what has happened now the rna part which is there in the okazaki fragment that part has gone instead of that we have the dna fragment but still we are left with the fragments okay so for that we bring in the dna ligase so finally we need another enzyme that is the dna ligase obviously what will do dna ligase will join the okazaki fragment so these are the different proteins and how they are carrying out the process of uh, replication so what will do i'll quickly summarize the function of the different proteins in the process of replication let's take a look So you can see here DNA polymerase. It is carrying out the polymerization. Uh, let's go in order. First, which is missing here, is the ORI binding protein. It is not mentioned here. Uh, okay, it is not mentioned here. What the ORI binding protein does? It identifies and denatures the ORI, which is the AT rich region. This is number one. This is number one. Okay, this is number one. Okay, 
so after that we said there is the entry of the single strand binding protein there is entry of the single strand binding protein which will prevent the rejoining of the double stranded dna after the action of single strand binding protein there will be action of helicase helicase will cause the unwinding helicase causes the unwinding of dna and in this function it is supported by the topoisomerase topoisomerase will relieve the torsion strain that is coming as a result of helicase induced unwinding at this point the dna primase will come in picture it will create the primer it initiates the synthesis of primer which is rna in nature you can see the rna primer is there which is then extended by the action of the dna polymerase please remember we have the dna polymerase 3 which is doing the primary synthesis and the dna polymerase 1 for the dna polymerase 1 what you have to remember the dna polymerase 1 it essentially replaces the primer first it will remove the primer and then put in the dna in place so what it is doing it is replacing the uh, primer once the primer has been replaced then finally the role of dna ligase comes into the picture it seals the single strand neck between the okazaki fragments on the lagging strand so these are the different proteins how they are functioning what is the function major function of each of the proteins very commonly you'll get the questions particularly on the role of uh, the topoisomerase particularly on the role of DNA ligase, role of the DNA polymerase 1. Remember, DNA polymerase 1 will cleave the RNA fragment, replace it with DNA segment. Therefore, what it does is, it is replacing the primer in the Okazaki fragment. But the fragments are still there. The joining of the fragments will be done by the DNA ligase. Okay. So, these are some of the important proteins and they are very, very important functions which you have to keep in mind. Okay. So let us now quickly talk about the different types of DNA damage which can occur. Different types of DNA damage are commonly seen during uh, the either the process of replication or otherwise also inside the cell there are various mechanisms which can cause the damage inside the DNA. Okay, so what are the different types of damages? What are the different types of uh, damages first is the single base alteration single base alteration then we can have the two base alteration and then we can have the chain breaks in single base alteration we can either have the base substitution also known as the point mutation so this base substitution or point mutation can appear in different ways one is mismatch one is mismatch and second mismatch can will occur during the replication second is the deamination the conversion of cytosine to uracil which we see sometimes is deamination the true mutation which is occurring inside the cell due to exposure to radiation or exposure to chemicals exposure to heat exposure to um, unfavorable conditions in these cases there can be spontaneous deamination resulting in conversion of cytosine to uracil rarely this conversion may involve the conversion of adenine into the hypoxanthine but this is much more rare more commonly we see the conversion of cytosine to uracil when we talk about uh, the Two base alteration the common example is the formation of the thymidine dimers the common example is the formation of the thymidine dimers and if you talk about the chain breaks we can have the single strand chain breaks we can have the single strand dna break and we can have the double strand dna break these are the different types of dna damage that you are likely to come across the mismatch the spontaneous deamination the formation of thymidine dimers the formation of single strand dna break and the formation of double strand dna break for each of the repair mechanisms the body has an inherent for each of the damages the body has an inherent repair mechanism okay so I'll quickly first mention the repair mechanisms 
and then we'll talk about associated disorders so for the mismatch we have what is known as mismatch repair we have what is known as the mismatch repair for the spontaneous deamination we have the mechanism known as base excision repair we have the mechanism known as the base excision repair so mismatch repair for mismatch base excision repair for the spontaneous deamination for the thymidine dimers we have what is known as the nucleotide excision repair nucleotide excision repair for single strand DNA break we have the mechanism known as the homologous repair reason being here the homologous strand of DNA is used for the repair and for double strand DNA break we have what is known as non homologous end joining so as the name indicates repair does not happen here the two strands are simply brought together and joined so suppose this is the dna and in this dna you have the break like this okay in this case the repair does not happen what happens is we bring this strand closer to the second strand and we end up get getting a shorter dna by joining the two strands by joining the two strands uh, the final um, uh, repair is happening so we are not replacing the segment which has been lost rather we are just joining the two ends by bringing them together this is the non homologous end joining <coughs> so when we write the mismatch repair as mmr the base section repair as ber the nucleotide section repair as ner Homologous repair as HR and non homologous end joining as NHEJ. Just like any other mechanism in our body, sometimes one or more of these repair mechanisms may not be working properly, they may be defective. So, one or more of repair mechanisms may be defective. In this case, they are going to result in some disease because some damage is occurring in the DNA, but we are not able to repair it. If you are not able to repair it, then that damage is going to express itself. Okay, so what are the diseases which can be seen? Let us quickly see. If the mismatch repair is not working properly, remember MMR means the mismatch repair, we get to see what is known as the hereditary non polyposis colonic carcinoma, also known as the Lynch syndrome hereditary non polyposis colonic carcinoma also known as the Lynch syndrome okay in case of basic strain repair we get the condition known as mute y homologue associated polyposis map this is a genetic diagnosis when we do the analysis then we get the diagnosis of map Clinically, this is a condition of familial adenomatous polyposis. Okay, so MAP is a subtype of FAP. In case of nucleotide skin repair defect, we have a series of disorders: xeroderma pigmentosum, the cocaine syndrome, and the trichothiodystrophy. This is the spectrum of disorder, most severe being the xeroderma pigmentosum, and the most simple or most you can say uh, less. Uh, intense is the trichothiodystrophy. So what is the important feature? See, xeroderma pigmentosum is commonly asked in the exam. So, you should know about this. What you should know? What is the defect? Defect is the NER is not working properly. What is the presentation? In case of presentation, you should remember there is sensitivity to exposure to sun. We have what is known as sun sensitivity why because commonly here the damage is occurring due to exposure to the uv light so when you go out in the sun uv exposure is there so we have the sun sensitivity so as a result of which there will be formation of the lesions on the skin so we'll have the skin lesions we'll have the skin lesions right following the skin lesions the skin lesions can 
turn malignant. So these skin lesions may develop not exactly into tumors but into uh, cancers. All right. So uh, in zona pigmentosum, the tendency for the malignancy is very very high. That is why it is called the most severe type. Whereas in trichothyroid dystrophy, the tendency for malignancy is very very low. Therefore, it is called the mildest form of this spectrum. When the hemolymphus repair is not working properly, in that case, we get some disorders like the Bloom syndrome, the Bloom syndrome, the Werner syndrome and the burka 1 and 2 the burka 1 and 2 whereas in case of non homo joining we get the severe combined immunodeficiency and the radiation sensitive SCID okay so bloom syndrome werner syndrome burka 1 with homologous repair defect and the SCID with the NHEJ defect Let's move on. Uh, okay, we are going to protein synthesis. One of you has put in a question in our telegram group. Let's take one short minute and quickly go through that question. I'll read out the question. Oral contraceptive failure occurs in a patient on rifampicin because, and the question is rifampicin induce the metabolism of contraceptive, rifampicin stimulate gonadotropin release, rifampicin decrease the secretion of progestin, and rifampicin antagonize the action of oral contraceptive okay so like you said rifampicin induces the metabolism of contraceptive uh, should be the answer what is happening here when the contraceptive is no longer there how will it act for its action the contraceptive has to be there but if the contraceptive is getting metabolized then its action will be minimized if its action is not there then the contraceptive will fail that is what we mean by failure of contraceptive if the molecule is getting degraded faster, which is happening in this case of rifampicin, rifampicin is activating the xenobiotic metabolism. So the contraceptive will get degraded. So that is the explanation that the contraceptive is getting degraded by the induction of the metabolic pathway and therefore its action, uh, duration of action is decreased. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to the protein synthesis. The process of protein synthesis is known as translation. There is not much to discuss in RNA synthesis, not going there. So let's talk about the protein synthesis <coughs> that is the translation. Okay, so in protein synthesis, what you have to understand, we have the three phases. We have what is known as initiation then we have what is known as elongation and finally we have what is known as the termination so what you have to remember in initiation the pro protein molecules which come into play the protein molecules which come into play these include the initiation factors eukaryotic initiation factor 1a 2 3 4 this 4 is 4 f and 5 these are the proteins <coughs> which will mainly participate in the process of initiation and at the end of initiation we get what is known as ats initiation complex so this is the summary of the initiation initiation uh, the some of the very important proteins which are involved are initiation factor 1a 2, 3, 4F and 5. At the end of initiation, we get the ATS initiation complex. In the elongation phase, what is happening? The peptide chain is getting elongated. Peptide chain is elongated as per the codon, as per the codon on the messenger RNA, as per the codon <coughs> on the messenger RNA, the peptide chain is elongated, right? So, in this process, the peptidyl transferase is involved. Please note, in this process, the enzyme peptidyl transferase is involved. Why this is important 
because the peptidyl transferase is a ribozyme if you are talking about the eukaryotes it will be the 28s ribosomal rna in the prokaryotes it will be the 23s ribosomal rna all right so this is an example of rna acting as enzyme we call it a ribozyme so in peptide chain elongation peptidyl transferase involved where uh, the peptidyl transferase is actually a ribozyme lastly we come to the process of termination which requires the presence of a stop codon and in this process the factors which are involved include the releasing factor which work in pairs so the pairs include 1 and 3 or 2 and 3 okay so these are the salient points which you have to keep in mind please also note in uh, the termination the peptidyl transferase is again involved it is involved in release of the formed peptide right so in termination we require three things we require the stop codon we require the releasing factor and we require the action of the peptidyl transferase okay this question has been asked a few times about the uh, elongation process what you remember the peptidyl transferase is actually the ribozyme here the rna is working as the enzyme 28 is ribosomal rna in the eukaryotes the 23 is ribosomal RNA in the prokaryotes and lastly in the process of initiation which all proteins are involved and what is the final product which is formed that is the ats initiation complex what else uh, when the initiation complex is formed inside the ribosome there are different sites so one question is what is the codon in ats initiation complex at the p site Please remember P site is uh, the place where the first uh, amino acid has been already attached during the process of initiation. So answer to this question should be A U G because here the methionine has to get attached and there is only one codon for methionine in our body and that is the A U G. So remember in the ATS initiation complex at P site always the codon will be A U G. There is no variation. Always, always, always it is going to be the a u g please note this point that uh, the codon at ats enzyme complex is the a u g another point which is sometimes asked is atp equivalent used in the process of initiation so here again you have to remember the answer which has to be given is 4 ATP equivalent. In the process of initiation, 4 ATP equivalent oh. is uh, used up in each initiation step. Okay. So these are some additional points which you have to keep in mind when we are talking about the protein synthesis. Okay. So let us quickly take a look at some additional points uh, in uh, the molecular biology that we have covered till now. What all you should be knowing? The end product of period metabolism in non-primate mammals. Quickly send in your answers. Very quickly send in your answers. Normally, what happens in the primate mammals? In primate mammals, the answer is uric acid. In primate mammals, the answer would be uric acid. What is the answer in the non-primate mammals? Quickly send in your answers. Please send in your answers. Okay. Please note, like I said, uric acid is present in the primate mammals. Ammonia is present mostly in the fishes. It is mostly present in the fishes uh, as the end product of natural metabolism same way urea is in product of the protein metabolism but in non-primate mammals the answer is allantoin the answer is allantoin the in non-primate mammals and the uric acid is further metabolized it is further metabolized by the action of enzyme uricase And gets converted into the water soluble substance called allantoin. Uric acid, you know, is sparingly water soluble, it, but uh, in some uh, non primate mammals, we have this enzyme uricase which can convert it to the water soluble form that is allantoin, so that the excretion is much, much, much better. It can be ex eliminated very quickly from the body. Okay. 
This question relates to gout where there is increased uric acid. I'm sure you know in gout what is happening. The uric acid is uh, uh, increased. So what is happening? There is predilection to grade 2. Yes, we know this first place where it appears is the grade 2. Uric acid levels at the time of attack may not be elevated. This is also a correct statement. Sometimes we see that borderline values are there and still the uric acid has got precipitated. Uric acid is coming due to increase in metabolism of the purine. This is also correct. The uric acid is not related to the pyrimidines. If the pyrimidine metabolism increases, there will be no change in the uric acid levels. So, it is not due to increased metabolism of pyrimidine. It is due to increased metabolism of the purine. Please keep in mind, it is due to increased metabolism of the purine and not the pyrimidine. The gap between segments of DNA on the lagging strand are sealed by, very very simple and important question, the gap between the segments of DNA on the lagging strand are sealed by, we had discussed this when we are talking about the DNA synthesis, the replication process, we had mentioned this specifically, we had highlighted, what is the answer? What is the answer? Please send in your answers. The answer is ligase. Okay. Sealed by means joined by. The answer is a ligase. It is joined by the action of the ligase. Very good. Ends of a chromosome replicated back. And this is a commonly repeated question. The ends of chromosome are replicated by. Uh, so, in uh, most of uh, the replication process, the ends of chromosome are not replicated. So, when the uh, replication of the end doesn't happen, what we see is the telomere shortening end of the DNA is called telomere and the, the telomere shortening is there. But in some cells, this uh, end of chromosome is replicated so that telomere shortening does not happen. Okay, This telomere shortening is prevented by the action of enzyme telomerase. Please keep in mind, telomerase is the uh, enzyme complex which will replicate the ends of uh, chromosome. Okay. This uh, telomerase is commonly present in the stem cells. It is present in the hair follicles. It is present in the epithelium of skin and GIT. It is present in the male germ cells. These are some of the places where commonly you will find the activated telomerase. Unfortunately, telomerase is also activated in the cancer cells. Okay, so these are some places where the telomerase will be active. Please keep in mind some places where the telomerase will be active. Now this question is related to the PCR, which enzyme has proofreading action? Please note the answer should be the PFU polymerase. The proofreading action is not present in TAC polymerase, but it is present in the PFU polymerase. About BST polymerase, what you should remember? It is used in what is known as the isothermal PCR. It is used in what is known as the isothermal PCR. Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay, I already told you this. The telomerase is not active in, it is present in the germ cells, it is active in the somatopoietic cells, it is active in the cancer cells. The answer is somatic cells. Somatic cells are the cells where telomerase are not active. Okazaki fragment will be produced only when you are doing the synthesis for the double stranded DNA. If you are synthesizing the single strand DNA or single strand RNA, then the Okazaki fragment will not be formed. It is formed when you are synthesizing the double stranded DNA. For one peptide bond formation, of four high energy phosphate are required. This is an information based question. Just please note down. For initiation, for initiation, yes, option one is right. A is right. For initiation, uh, 
we require 4 high energy phosphate for every amino acid means for every peptide bond formation we again require the 4 ATP equivalent. Okay, all of the following are involved in microRNA synthesis except we already said drosha is required, pasha is required, dicer is required, sasha is not required. Sasha must be a villain in some Hindi serial, I don't know, but uh, it is not involved in the microRNA synthesis where we have the drosha, pasha, and dicer. Remember the alternate name for pasha is dgcr8 alternate name for pasha is dgcr8 we must yes in that question option a was right yes we had, we had i take it the option a was the right option there okay so now we let's uh, move on to the enzymes what are the important points you should be knowing in enzyme let us quickly cover those points and, and then we'll go from there so first what are enzymes so enzymes broadly speaking they are proteins with the exception of ribozyme we already said ribozymes are rna which act as enzymes okay and second point they are catalyst they are biological molecules which are acting as catalyst so we call them the bio catalyst so they are uh, proteins except ribozyme and they are bio catalyst so important thing to understand is what is their function their function is to decrease the energy of activation this is what a catalyst does in the bio chemistry if you see the catalyst it decreases the energy of activation so enzyme is also a catalyst it will perform the same function it decreases the energy of activation of a reaction if you go to a classification what are the classes that you should be knowing about first class is oxidoreductive which is involved in oxidation and reduction second class is transferase which is involved in the transfer of function group third class is the hydrolase which will break the molecules it will break the molecules using water fourth class is lyase this will also break the molecules but for this it doesn't require water it will break the molecules without using the water commonly it is acting on the double bonds isomerase will rearrange the atoms within the molecule whereas ligase will join uh, two molecules please note recently a new class has been added uh, three four years back by the name of the translocase so we have another class called the translocase what the translocase does it transports molecules across the membrane from one compartment to another it will take the molecule from one compartment to another it will take the molecule and therefore it is known as translocase it is changing the location of the molecule so we call it the translocase transports molecules across the membranes from the uh, cell it will take it outside or from inside the mitochondrial matrix it will take it to the cytoplasm from cytoplasm it will take it to the endoplasmic reticulum when it is uh, transporting across the membrane we call the enzyme as oxidoreductase so they have their numbers this is class one this is class two this is class three i have written them in sequence class four class five class six and class seven so you can remember this like this authlet you can just uh, write the first letter of each class so remember them in a sequence this will help you to remember them in a sequence authlet first letter of each word written in sequence so what are the constituents of uh, the uh, ribosome uh, sorry of the enzyme the completely functional enzyme is known as holoenzyme right the completely functional enzyme is called holozyme it is made up of a protein part we call the protein part as apoenzyme the protein part is called the apoenzyme this is the part where the active site is there this is the catalytic unit then we have the non-protein part in the non-protein part and the attachment can either be non-covalent or it can be covalent attachment in non-covalent attachment we can have coenzymes and cofactors coenzymes are organic molecules whereas cofactors are inorganic molecules mainly they are acting as activators mainly they are acting as activators whereas coenzyme can sometimes act as the co-substrate 
they can also act as the co substrate okay if the molecule is attached covalently it doesn't matter whether it is organic or inorganic whether it is participating in the reaction or not all of them are simply known as the prosthetic group there can be some minor variations in different textbooks but overall this is the most widely accepted composition or you can say the description of the components in case of an active enzyme sometimes we find metals in the enzyme they can participate in activation in which case we call the enzyme as metal activated enzyme sometimes they may be covalently attached with the enzyme in which case we call them the metallo enzyme so depending on how the metal is present in the enzyme whether it is coming in only for the reaction or it is covalently linked to the enzyme and consistently a part of the enzyme based on that we have the metal activated enzyme and the metallo enzyme important properties of the enzymes which you should know there is an active site where the catalysis occurs this is where the catalysis occurs right so the substrate will come and get attached here after catalysis the product will also be temporarily attached here so this is the active site then the very very important point which is nowadays being asked repeatedly is about catalytic efficiency so here you have to remember two things Number one, how do you define the catalytic efficiency? For this, we have the formula called K cat upon K m. But please remember what is in the numerator, what is in the denominator. So we have the K cat upon K m. So you can just be asked which of the following is the correct formula for catalytic efficiency. We have also seen numericals coming from this formula. The values for K cat and K m are given for four different sets of reactions. You have to tell which one has the best catalytic efficiency. Okay, the Okay, so two things. So one is the catalytic efficiency, and second, you have to watch out for the numericals based on this particular formula. So only one word which I want to say here. Please make sure the units are same before you do any comparison. Before you do any comparison, please make sure that the units for the various options are the same. Otherwise, your comparison will not be correct. And then we know that enzymes are specific. They can either be very, very specific. We call the lock and key model or they can be slightly flexible. We call it the induced field model. So just remember enzymes show specificity for the substrate. So these are the primary properties of the uh, enzymes. In addition, they may also have an allosteric site. What happens here? Molecules will get attached, but there is no catalysis here. Molecule will get attached, but the catalysis does not occur at this site. The enzymes may undergo the covalent modification. The covalent modification, what it will do? It will change the nature of the protein because of which either the uh, rate of activity will be reduced or the maximum uh, catalytic activity that can have that is reduced. So either the Vmax or the Km, these are the two points which are getting affected. Some of the enzymes may make use of the cofactors or the coenzyme, which is not necessary to always have the cofactor or the coenzyme, but some of them require, some of them do not require. So now we come to the point which is called the enzyme kinetics. Enzyme kinetics means uh, how the enzyme are participating in the reaction. So here please note, just like any reaction, we can have the zero order, the first order, the second order reactions can be there. Mostly we focus on the first order reactions which are present first order reactions which are present all in the biological system in the largest amount most of the reaction biological system are first order reactions so we are trying to understand uh, the mechanisms involved in the first order reactions where the enzymes are participating and the best equation that we have is what is known as the michaelis menten equation very frequently you'll get various options in the exam where you have to identify the correct michaelis menten equation so please make note of this uh, description of the michaelis menten equation as per michaelis menten equation vi that is the initial velocity <coughs> Is equal to Vmax into substrate concentration upon Km plus substrate concentration. When you draw the graph for this, 
where on the x-axis we have the substrate concentration on the y-axis we have the vi we get a graph something like this initially it is a straight line then there is a curve and then there is a black face so in the graph for michaelis menten equation the values for the uh, michaelis menten equation what is on the y side uh, left and the right side okay so here what you have to note number 1 if you try to find out the maximum velocity of a reaction maximum velocity of the reaction is achieved when the substrate concentration is infinite <coughs> when the substrate concentration is infinite only then the vmax is achieved now this plateau phase which is there this plateau phase which is there it will be it will get converted into vmax at infinity so we have a line running parallel to the plateau phase and we know and two parallel lines will go and meet at infinity okay so when the substrate concentration becomes infinity the two lines will match what this means it is not possible to uh, identify the vmax in the lab you can do the calculation but not the uh, practical work or the experimentation so for that we make use of vmax by 2 and as you can see from the graph the vmax by 2 is very much achievable inside the lab it is very much achievable inside the lab so we can we achieve the vmax by 2 once the vmax by 2 is achieved we drop it on the graph <coughs> and then another perpendicular on the x axis we draw it on the graph and then put another perpendicular on the x axis wherever this perpendicular touches the x axis we call this point as km so by definition only you can see km is the substrate concentration at half the vmax km mm -hmm. is the substrate concentration at half the vmax okay so it tells us about the affinity remember km tells us about affinity the km and affinity are inversely related if the value of km is more then the affinity is less if the value of km is less then the affinity is more so remember km is a substrate concentration at half the vmax and km tells us about affinity km and affinity are inversely related they are inversely related but the michaelis menten equation uh, is not used for comparison because there is a curve in the graph it is not used for comparison for comparison we use a different graph called the Lineberg plot also known as the double reciprocal plot the equation for double reciprocal plot is given on your screen please make note of this on the left side we have 1 upon vi reciprocal of vi on the right side we have km upon vmax into 1 upon substrate concentration plus 1 upon vmax okay so in this equation we have to identify certain points so first we'll draw the graph and we'll see how the graph is coming for the double reciprocal plot and then come back to the points that we should know in this equation so first thing you have to note when you come to this graph is on the x-axis we have reciprocal of substrate on the y-axis we have reciprocal of velocity that is why it is known as the double that is why it is known as the double reciprocal plot on both the axis we have the reciprocal values on both the axis we have the reciprocal values that is why it is known as the double reciprocal plot how many of you are in delhi we just had a very short bout of earthquake I think this was the aftershock uh, of the earthquake which was felt a uh, few days back I think four, three or four days back we had a good earthquake in Delhi coming from Nepal uh, and just now I think we felt the aftershocks at that three four minutes back the uh, laptop and the screen were vibrating I could also feel the vibrations so uh, please be careful those who are staying in high rises or those other places uh, if you need you can take a break and step out.
Okay, let's see this double reciprocal plot also known as the line viewer bug plot. So you see here we have to make note of a few things. Number one, where the graph is crossing the y-axis. The graph is not passing through zero. Okay, it is not passing through zero. It, there is a point on the y-axis where it is crossing. We call it the y-intercept. The value is one upon v max. Because it is not passing through zero, it will uh, cross the graph at a certain point on the x-axis, which will be known as the x-intercept. Right? Value is minus one by km. The value is minus one by km. The third value which you have to note is the slope of the graph, which is km upon v max. This is the constant in the equation. In the, in the equation, if you see. In then we have work plot equation you see the constant is came upon v max this would be the slope and this one upon v max would be the y intercept all this follows from the equation from the equation for straight line graph y is equal to m x plus c so everything is following from there what is y is equal to m x plus c so here m is the slope x is the variable and c is the y intercept okay so the same thing is there in this graph so i've noted down the points what is x intercept what is y intercept what is slope if you have not written it separately please make sure you note this you can be asked as a single one line question x intercept in line of plot is y intercept in line of plot is what is the slope in the line of plot these are simple straightforward questions which you should be able to answer rarely very rarely if the examiner is in a bad mood you may get a question on the single reciprocal plot here you have to know only two things number one tell me some names for single reciprocal plot answer is eddie hofstie plot and the hannes wolf plot the eddie hofstie plot and the hannes wolf plot second when will you make use of the single reciprocal plot because making them is very very cumbersome we don't want to make these type of graph but in certain cases we don't have a choice we have to make use of single reciprocal plot and that condition is the clustering if you find clustering on the line viewer work plot in that case you don't have any other option but to make use of the single reciprocal plot so two things you have to remember the name and second, when we are making use of the single reciprocal plot, just to avoid the clustering on the line weaver bug plot. Now, till now we are talking about enzyme kinetics, but there are certain factors which will affect the reaction velocity. What are those factors and how they are going to affect the reaction velocity? How the graph will change with these factors? Please keep in mind, uh, except for the factor that we are talking about, all the conditions must be ideal to understand the effect of that factor. Okay. First is substrate concentration. We already seen the type of graph that we see here on the x-axis. We have substrate on the y-axis velocity, straight line curve, and the plateau phase. This is the hyperbolic curve that we see for change in substrate concentration. And then we have the temperature. For temperature, what you have to understand that there is an optimum temperature. If you're talking about temperature, there is an optimum temperature at which you are likely to get the Vmax. Optimum temperature where you get the Vmax. Okay. When you move away from this point, from this temperature point, whether you are increasing the temperature or you are decreasing the temperature, it doesn't matter. When you move away from this optimum temperature, there is a sharp drop in velocity. This sharp drop in velocity, we call this the bell shaped curve. The bell shaped curve is seen for change in temperature. And the same thing you are going to see for the pH also. For pH also, we have the optimum pH where the best activity is there. When you move away from that pH, there is a sharp drop in velocity. Lastly, we talk about the enzyme concentration. Now, enzyme is the actual worker. It is the catalyst. It is describing how many workers are getting involved in conversion of substrate to product. So, in this case, what will happen? You keep increasing the number or the molecules of enzymes 
the activity will keep increasing. So in other words, the velocity will keep increasing. We get the linear curve for the enzyme with the velocity. This goes in the other way around also. If you decrease the number of molecules, then the velocity will decrease also. Okay, so keep that in mind. And now we talk about enzyme inhibition. Before I go into enzyme inhibition, I'll quickly highlight that enzyme inhibition may be irreversible. One of the very important examples of an irreversible enzyme inhibition is a societal inhibition. Okay, it may be irreversible or it may be reversible. Now, reversible is more interesting. Why? Because you can interfere in the reversal inhibition. You can uh, reclaim the enzyme which has got inactivated. So, most of our discussion is focused here. Most of our discussion is focused on the reversible inhibition, right? Most of it is focused on reversible inhibition. So, when you talk about reversible inhibition, it is of three broad categories. You have the competitive inhibition. Competitive inhibition means the substrate will compete with the inhibitor both of them want to attach at the active site okay both of them attach at active site that is the competitive example is malonate versus succinate at the enzyme succinate dehydrogenase second is non-competitive i'll write the point here in competitive inhibitor attaches at active site as a result, there is competition. The substrate also wants to attach at the active site. So, there will be competition. We call it the competitive inhibition. In case of non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor attaches at a different location. What is the different location? The answer is the allosteric site. It attaches at the allosteric site. Okay, inhibitor attaches to the allosteric site. So, because it is attaching at the allosteric site, there is no competition. The substrate will go and attach at the active site, not at the allosteric site. So, there is no competition. Then this is a non competitive inhibitor. Then we have uncompetitive inhibitor, where the inhibitor does not attach to the enzyme at any place. Rather, it waits for the enzyme and substrate to interact and it will only attach with enzyme substrate complex please keep this in mind mind uncompetitive inhibitor attaches at the enzyme substrate complex not at the active site not at the allosteric site but it will wait for the substrate and enzyme to come together once they are together it will expose a site where the inhibitor can attach so it is only attaching to the enzyme substrate complex so you can write it in the form of a table, you can draw arrows, if you remember better with arrows, you can draw arrows, okay. Now in, in, in this uh, table, a very important thing which I would ask you to note is wherever it is written, no change. Wherever it is written, no change, please make a note of it. In competitive inhibition, what is not changing? Answer is Vmax. In non-competitive inhibitor, what is not changing? The answer is the KM. Please make note of these two points. Why? Because they are going to help you when you talk about inhibitors on the line viewer work plot. They will help you to identify which one, which inhibition graph are we looking at. So, take a look at the graphs. This is the uninhibited normal, normal graph. The green color is the normal graph. Now, look at panel B. In panel B, what do you see? There is a regular uninhibited graph. And then we have a second graph, which is different from the regular uninhibited graph. So, Alright, it is different from the regular uninhibited graph. Now, how to identify which type of inhibition is seen in this second graph? So, we look at um, the graph and we find it has the same y-intercept as the uninhibited graph, right? Y-intercept indicates 1 upon Vmax. If you remember, it indicates 1 upon Vmax. So, if 1 upon Vmax is same, then the Vmax must be same. In the previous table, I asked you where the Vmax does not change, where it is normal. You have noted it is normal where? It is normal in a competitive inhibition. Therefore, this is the graph for the competitive inhibition. Let us look at another graph. In this graph, what do you find? That inhibitor and the normal equation have the same minus 1 upon km. This is the 
x intercept they have the same minus 1 upon km means they have the same km the km is also the same in this case and the table you had seen in one of the cases the km is same there is no change in the km if you recall that particular case was the non competitive inhibition so if there is no change in the vmax if the vmax is normal then we are looking at competitive inhibition if there is no change in the km then we are looking at non competitive inhibition lastly you sometimes find both are changed see the y intercept is also different the x intercept is also different if both are changing then obviously we are looking at the un competitive inhibition we are looking at the uncompetitive inhibition so just by remembering what factor is normal in which of the cases you can quickly identify the graph you don't need to know kya bada kya ghata what is the change we don't need to know that okay so this is about the enzyme inhibition these are reversible inhibitions please remember i am repeating this is the reversible type of enzyme inhibition for the irreversible i have given you one very important example which you should keep in mind the suicide inhibition this is a sub type of the irreversible inhibition for example the action of the aspirin on cox the action of uh, penicillin on uh, uh, peptidyl glycosan transferase uh, the action of the uh, um, uh, mm, Allopurinol on the xanthine oxidase. All of these are examples of suicide inhibition. Action of 5-fluorouracil on thymidylate synthase. All of these are examples of the suicide inhibition. Let's move on to the isoenzymes. About isoenzymes, first thing to notice: these are enzymes having similar functions. So we are looking at molecules. We are looking at molecules. which have similar enzymatic function they have a similar catalytic activity enzyme means catalyst catalyst so different molecules with similarity in catalytic activity all right we call them the isoenzyme however except for the catalytic activity all the other features can be same okay they can have different km they can have different vmax they can have different structure they can have different electrophoretic mobility they can have different immunological identity they can have different uh, allosteric regulation they can have different location inside the cell or in the body means they can even have a different compartment within one cell or they may be present exclusively in the different tissues in the heart we have the different isoenzyme in the muscle we have different isoenzyme in the liver we have the different isoenzyme like that they can have the different location also in our body both in terms of the organ or in terms of the compartment that we are talking about some classical examples of isoenzyme creatine phosphokinase three subtypes type one type two type three the cpk is actually made up of two polypeptide and for these two types we have two genes these genes are the b type and m type so when you make the combination you can have three different combinations both of them are b both of them are m one b and one m so like that you can see the three combinations are there and each combination is synthesized in a different uh, organ itself so type 1 is coming from the brain type 2 is coming from the heart type 3 is coming from the muscle so like that we can have second example is ldh you can see here five different subtypes 1 2 3 4 and five different subtypes type 1 coming from heart type 4 and 5 both come from liver and muscle type 2 which is the most abundant subtype is coming from the erythrocytes please remember this is the most abundant in blood when you are measuring in the blood this subtype is most abundant why because rbc will break down so all its content is coming out in the blood the type 3 is non specific it is synthesized by the large number of tissues the type 3 is non specific so these are some examples of isoenzyme in the different subtypes and uh, uh, where they are present you can see they are present in the different compartments and different organs in our body let's quickly like cut some questions uh, most of these you should be able to quickly answer the double reciprocal plot 
is also known as the answer is line weaver work plot we've just seen this the double reciprocal plot is the line weaver work plot Teddy of the plot and Hannes will plot are the single reciprocal plots we have written these names it is the single reciprocal plot very good very good let's go on to the next question if km increases but vmax remains the same see we had highlighted what part remains the same then what type of enzyme inhibition are you looking at what type of enzyme inhibition are you looking at if v max remains the same so again and again you can see what is same that is the part which is helping us in the question so we have to focus on the part which is remaining the same very good the answer is the competitive inhibition answer is the competitive inhibition moving on to question number three all are true about isoenzyme except they can have different k value yes they can have different electrophoretic mobility, yes. They can have different physical properties, yes. They can act on different substrate. No, they're catalyzing the same reaction. Isoenzyme are catalyzing the same reaction. So they must have the same substrate. This cannot be correct statement. Okay. So this is not a true about the isoenzymes. We just say they can have different KM, they can have the different Vmax, they can have different electrophoretic mobility, they can have different diastatic regulation. All of these can be different, except for the action on different substrate going on to next question oxidation reduction reaction occurs with all of the following enzymes except hydrolase peroxidase oxidase dehydrogenase what is the answer to this question anyone quickly send in the answer oxidation reduction reaction occurs with all of the following enzymes except okay very good please note peroxidase <coughs> oxidase dehydrogenase all of these are involved with oxidation reduction hydrolase is actually a different class of enzyme it is the class 3 enzyme whereas the uh, option 2 3 and 4 are the oxidoreductase this is the oxidoreductase which is actually the class 1 enzyme so we have the class 3 and the class 1 enzyme lactate dehydrogenase levels are increased and in. you have to go back to that uh, slide that i have shown you and there you have written from where the different types of ldh are coming okay so here if you note it can be true for a large number of these options but the best possible answer where ldh alone can help us to make a diagnosis that is myocardial infarction for all others we will need additional parameters okay in fact in diabetes mellitus it is not even elevated it may be elevated in the acute pancreatitis and the acute glomerulonephritis but it is not elevated alone you cannot make a diagnosis using only the ldh you will need additional parameters so the best possible answer in this case would be the myocardial infarction. Very important tricky clinical case. Please read the question carefully. Patient admitted to ICU with acute myocardial infarction suffers a second attack on the fourth day. Which of the following should be used to confirm the diagnosis? Here what you have to understand that commonly for the troponins, Commonly for the troponins, we have this card test which is available, right? This card test is available wherein you put the three drops of blood. You put in the three drops of blood and after some time you get the result. This is the control. And in test, you may get a positive or you may not get any line <coughs> at the test site. Okay. Now, the CAR test cannot be used again on the fourth test. Why? Because it is only telling us plus minus, whether it is elevated or not. The troponin that you are trying to measure, whether it is elevated or not, only that information will be provided by the CAR test. So, it is looking at the relative concentration and about the troponin, what you have to remember? they remain elevated for 7 to 10 days so 
what is happening here within 24 to 36 hours it has reached the peak but after that it will remain elevated so if you try to do a test here even though there is no myocardial infarction, this test will be positive. If you do the test here, even though there is no fresh myocardial infarction, this test will still be positive. So, in cases of re-infarct, you cannot make use of the CAR test. If you have the absolute value of troponin, you have the auto analyzer where the troponin values are provided, then you can make use of troponin. But if the CAR test, which is more commonly available, it is available, then you can't use the uh, troponin CAR test. There, you have to go for CPKMD, which is readily available. Even in a semi auto analyzer, you can uh, measure the value of the uh, CPKMD. Why? Because it reaches the baseline within two to three days. So, on day four, if the MI is there, it will rise again. On day four, if MI is there, it will rise again. If there is no MI, then there is no troponin. So, you know, no CPKMD. So, if you try to measure it, the values will not be elevated. So, for re impact you cannot make use of the card test you can make use of the troponin where you have to get the serial values where you have to get the serial values okay but this will be limited to those centers which have the facility to measure the troponin values so this is a slightly uh, you can say uh, very costly, costly test at the higher side and it requires a very good equipment. So, a large number of hospitals may not be having this facility. For this question, the answer is CPKMB. It is a re impact. We cannot just use a single value of proponent. We would require a serial value, which is not described here. In that case, we go for the CKMB. Okay, so what we can do is uh, we have covered uh, two very important topics. We have talked about the monthly biology and we have talked about the enzymes. In the next class, we can quickly go through the metabolism of amino acid, the carbohydrate and the lipid and very briefly look at uh, three, four points in the uh, uh, vitamins. Vitamins, uh, sometimes we get the question in the form clinical case, straight one liners. So, we will also look at that. So, in the next class, these are the points that I am going to cover. In the meantime, if you have any doubts, any queries, any part you want me to repeat from the two topics that we have covered today, just drop in a message in the Telegram group. I will make sure we cover those points. If any point you think uh, has been asked in the exam from these two uh, topics which we covered, again, you can drop a uh, mention in the Telegram group and I will try to cover that in the next class. Time for meeting. So, for today, this is all uh, from uh, my side. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for listening so patiently and participating in the question answer uh, session. Uh, we will have this uh, continued probably on Monday and Dr. Sushant will confirm when we are having the next class. Thank you very much. Stay safe and keep revising for the exam which is just around the corner. Take care. Bye-bye.